Heritage Center doing uh, maintenance and repair of the building. Uh, I appreciate the organization because I've always loved um, historical items and they do an amazing job of saving these for future people to appreciate and nobody is really doing that in Portland other than them. So. My name is Emily and I volunteer here at the Architectural Heritage Center every week. I have been helping out with the archiving and cataloging of the wallpaper collection here. Um, I really value the ways in which we are able to connect through architecture and I appreciate how the AHC is able to empower the community through sharing knowledge about the built environment and our cultural heritage. Uh, without the AHC, a lot of our architectural history and artifacts like these would be lost.
on here, here at the Architectural Heritage Center. There are basically two things that, that uh, have attracted me to this position. The first one is, I get to work in one of the most beautiful buildings in all of Portland. The other thing is, is that as a volunteer, I get to meet all sorts of interesting people from Portland and all across the country. Hey, welcome to Building Stories 2022. Happy Ides of March. Today we're exploring stories about Portland's architecture and history. My name's Alan Dennison, and I'm coming to you live from studios in Northeast Portland. A big welcome to everyone joining from your home, from your office, from your car, wherever you are, even outside of Portland. It's a nice, uh, the nice thing about a virtual event is that you can participate from all over. I understand there's some people from really far away. It's an advantage of technology. We have a great evening planned for you. And at tonight's Building Stories event, Building Stories, we're going to preview for the very first time a series of short videos that tell stories behind both familiar and less familiar historic places in the, in the Portland area. The AHC has collaborated with some fantastic local filmmakers to create these original video shorts. They launched tonight, so you're the first to see them. I think you're really going to enjoy them and even learn some things that you didn't know about Portland's architecture and history. Now, I know we have a lot of experts watching, but I'm willing to bet that tonight each of you will learn something new and come away even more engaged in Portland's built environment and history. 
And that's the very mission of the AHC. That's what we do, to educate and advocate so that more people can be involved in supporting the city's, city's historic fabric. I'll be joined by some special guests, both on the stage here and coming in by video. We'll also hear from a bunch of different AHC supporters telling their own stories. And that includes you. This program is designed so everyone can participate. So throughout the evening, use the chat window to tell us, uh, chat window's there, to tell us why you support the AHC. Oh, the chat window's there. Go ahead and test out the chat window now. Say hello so everybody knows who's, who's watching all of this. Try it out. Meet your buddies. Now, this evening is also an opportunity to directly support the work of the Architectural Heritage Center by making a financial gift to the organization. You knew that, didn't you? This annual fundraiser looks different from the years past when we gathered in person, and we'll do that again soon. I hope it's next year. I so much want to see all of you. But use the chat window in the meantime. Uh, the important thing is that we're still coming together to support the AHC. That hasn't changed. We've made it easy for you to donate online tonight. You simply click on the Donate button, or you can donate by text message. You simply, simply text Visit AHC to the phone number 56651, which is on your screen, I think. We're live. We're making this as fast as we can. You can donate at any time tonight. And if you need help, actual people are at 503-231-7264. That probably sounds familiar. That's the phone number of the AHC. So if it's in your contacts and that's easier, go ahead. Um, people, actual people are there to, to assist you. And uh, we'll take donations of any kind. Uh, give them a call and tell them what you're going to do. Checks, dare I say Bitcoin? I don't know. Cash, coupons, who knows? Those are the people. Uh, who will answer the phone at the AHC Center, 503-231-7264. We don't want anything to get in your way, nothing technical or anything else. We'll help you donate. So on with the program. This program is being made possible thanks to our presenting sponsor, Earthquake Tech. We thank owner Steve Gemmel and his team for the wonderful support of the AHC's work. Earthquake Tech has been doing seismic retrofitting and rehabilitation since 1999. They're a generous sponsor and business member of the Architectural Heritage Center and an anchor of support. So let's watch this video message from Earthquake Tech and hear more about what they do. It's such a privilege to be the presenting sponsor for this year's Architectural Heritage Center's annual gala, Building Stories. We've been working with the AHC for the last decade. Their mission to maintain Portland's rich architectural heritage aligns well with our mission to keep Portland's old homes on their foundations. It's easy to see the connection between our two organizations. Historically, our introduction to the AHC happened when they asked us to do a presentation on seismic retrofitting and bolting your old home down to safeguard it in case of an earthquake. Through our partnership with the AHC, I was introduced to the Han House Project. We here at Earthquake Tech love the opportunity to take on challenging projects and the Han House was just that. Just to put it in perspective, the Han House has a massive 2,000 square foot basement and nine foot tall brick foundation walls. For us, this was an opportunity to use a new retrofitting system. Working on the Han House was an extreme case of seismic retrofitting and we loved the challenge, but really the sustainability of our business consists of working on everyday homes. Whether that's bolting down an old home to its foundation or digging out a basement to create an ADU or just more livable space with increased headroom, we look forward to serving Portland's older homes for years to come. Thank you again to Steve Gemmel and Earthquake Tech for their commitment to Portland's unique residential architecture and for being such a foundation of support to the Architectural Heritage Center. Little wordplay there. Earthquake Tech has always donated to, all, to our raffle. Uh, has, I'm sorry, they have also donated to the raffle. I mean, that many. Yes, we have a raffle. We have a raffle you can enter to win two prizes. First one is an emergency gas shutoff valve for your home, gener generously donated by uh, Earthquake Tech. And how many of you can say that you have one of those? Judith? Okay, the rest of you, you probably need one. And a five night stay is the other one uh, at a cozy cottage in beautiful Seaview, Washington, down at the bottom of the Long, uh, Long Beach Peninsula. That's given by longtime supporters Eileen Fitzsimons and Gary Blackmer. So just click 
raffle on the button to enter. Okay, we already have some donations coming in, so thank you. Um, we know each of you has a reason why you care about the work for the HC, so let's hear from a few people about why they support the Architectural Heritage Center. Hi, I'm Merritt. And I'm Jeanette, and we're both docents with the AHC. I enjoy working with the AHC because I think it provides a sustainable model for the preservation of both knowledge and objects. And I love the opportunity to learn more about Portland's architectural history and share it with other people on the tours. I'm Doug Magadance. I retired as curator and I'm now volunteering for the Bosco Milligan Foundation at the Architectural Heritage Center. And uh, I believe in the organization and believe in the value of the collections. Hi, I'm Norman Goldston, longtime volunteer with the Architectural Heritage Center and Collections Committee. Always interested in, in the history of the local architecture and the spaces that people uh, occupied in the past and the objects that surrounded them. Laurel Dickey, a longtime supporter and volunteer for the Architectural Heritage Center. I've lived in Portland my whole life. Over the years, I've developed a strong sense of place. AHC helped me discover the quirks, secrets, wonderful, and sometimes sad events which inform the lives of Portlanders. I'm passionate about getting the word out about Portland's human history and famous, quirky, and historic architecture. Hi, my name is Fred Leeson. I've been a volunteer at the Architectural Heritage Center in several capacities over 14 years. I care about Portland history. I care about architectural history. I care about trying to serve our best vintage buildings in Portland. And all of those interests for me converge at the Architectural Heritage Center. When the world gets back to normal, I hope you will come and see us. Okay, a big high five to all of our amazing volunteers and supporters of the AHC. Did you just hit your computer screens? Careful with those, a little dabbed. I'm, I'm also one of them. Uh, the organization thrives on the involvement and contributions of people like you. A lot of AHC's volunteers are watching tonight, and in a typical year, our volunteers give over 3,000 hours, at least, of their time, and they're some of our biggest champions. If you're a volunteer, we want to hear from you. So no, go now to the chat window and say hello. Your buddies are there. Call, so calling all the walking tour docents, exhibit gallery volunteers, committee volunteers, uh, board members, hooray for the board members, advisory board members, any AHC volunteer, please say hello. Go to the chat room. You're here tonight because you're part of, uh, of our community. To make your donation to the AHC, just click the donate button above above and grab your phone and text visit AHC to the phone number 56651. Historical people, let me add a note. Grab your cell phone and text 56651. I've seen the phones that are out there. Thank you, Harris. Thank you, wall phone. Get your cell phones, 56651. You'll get a message that will take you through the payment process and it's that easy, I'm told. As you make donations, the thermometer will rise. Now, where do we have it? There it is, the thermometer. Well, we have some donations in. Okay, good. Um, and we'd like to thank a group of folks who have helped kickstart tonight's fundraising, uh, thanks to gifts that they chose to donate when they registered for this event. We really appreciate their gen generosity. And they're on the screen, there they are. When you donate this evening, your name will scroll on our giving screen. You can cheer each other by using the chat window. We're missing that, not all being in a big room where you can say yay for people's donations. Congratulate them, congratulate them. Give them a high five, whatever, in the chat room. Okay, now, tonight we launched three video shorts created by local filmmakers in collaboration with the AHC that explore our city's history and architecture. We appreciate all these, all the many people who participated in these projects. Our first video story is about the AHC's collection of architectural artifacts and how each item has an interesting story to tell. In this video, we'll see what we can learn from a six foot tall art artifact. I am not a six foot long art artifact. It's from another six foot long artifact. You'll see it in the video, so watch carefully. It's journeyed from the house to a museum, from the site of a shopping center, to the AHC collections. So let's watch this video. Uh, the story 
created by Shannon Doran and the AV department. That's right here, that's where we are, and produced by AHC's Gene Zondervan. The Architectural Heritage Center's artifact collection began as the personal collection of our founders, Jerry Bosco, who started collecting as a teenager in the 1950s, and Ben Milligan. Between the 1950s and the 1980s, they collected pieces from buildings all over the Portland area, from around the, the region, and even across the country. And then over the years, ensuing years, we've also added additional artifacts from other donors. The AHC has a collection now of more than 200 art glass windows that includes stained glass and leaded glass uh, windows of all shapes and sizes stored here at the center. This stained glass window was purchased in 1955 by Jerry Bosco from the Lloyd Corporation as they were getting ready to build the Lloyd Center Mall in Northeast Portland. The window was in a house uh, that was built back in the 1890s, but by the early 1950s was actually in use as the Battleship Oregon Museum. The Battleship Oregon was one of three first-generation U.S. battleships that were launched in 1893, and it was the only one of the three that was built on the West Coast, which made it a really big deal for Oregonians in particular because the ship was named after them. It was launched from the West Coast. So in 1898, when the war with Spain was starting, the U.S. Navy ordered the ship to sail around Cape Horn. So it was able to be there for the Battle of Santiago. And this was followed very closely in the national press. And it did so well in the battle that it was world famous. The battleship Oregon was preserved due to people all over the country mobilizing to find it a home. The curator of the Battleship Oregon Museum, who was also the secretary, was Cora A. Thompson, and she was able to pass a resolution at one of the national conventions of the United Spanish War Veterans to make the ship the main repository of Spanish-American War and Philippine-American War history. So she got people donating their belongings from all over the country to build the collection of this museum. The War Production Board reclaimed the battleship Oregon to use as scrap in 1943, and the museum collection had to move off the ship. The Oregon Museum Foundation, Inc. owned this house in the Lloyd District that had been damaged in an earthquake in 1949. So the Battleship Oregon Museum collection was able to move into that home. Researching the AHC's artifact collection is an ongoing process as we try to find the history and the stories behind the pieces in our collection. Bosco and Milligan kept very interesting records and for a long time we weren't able to identify where this window came from. We discovered on their collection of 3 by 5 note cards that we found that uh, Jerry had made notes about when he purchased it and this was true for a lot of the collection um, including stained glass windows and some other artifacts that they actually just kept all of their records on 3 by 5 note cards. Uh, most recently for the past few years we've been working with a volunteer to help us identify the art glass artisans uh, from the late 19th and early 20th century who made some of the beautiful stained glass windows not only in our collection but also in the buildings that are still standing around the Portland area. And soon we'll see what the next chapter will be for the Lloyd Center. Okay, joining me now is Stephanie Whitlock, Executive Director of the Architectural Heritage Center. Thank you, Alan, and a heartfelt thank you to everyone who was with us tonight. We are so grateful that you have chosen to spend time with us. I always knew that the Architectural Heritage Center had a strong community of supporters, and times like these really make this evident. 
We're excited that tonight we're launching original videos about just a few things that make Portland's architecture, history, and culture so special. I'd like to extend my deepest appreciation to everyone who had a part in these videos. The filmmakers and their crews, AHC staff, the story advisors and consultants, but mostly the people who are in the videos. When we asked folks to participate on camera, not a single person told us no. In fact, people were extremely generous in sharing their personal stories, their expertise, and passions with us. And it's because of them that this event is all the richer. So the videos that you see tonight show the many sides of our work in preservation, from our artifact and archival collections, our research and educational programs, our policy advocacy, or our exhibits. Even our historic building, the West Block, makes an appearance in several videos. We're committed to saving places and uncovering the, the diverse histories of these places. And we do it in so many ways and unlike so many other organizations. Well, what are some of the things that the AHC has been focused on? Well, if anything, the pandemic has encouraged us to try new kinds of programs that reach new audiences. One project I'm really excited about is a guidebook we created to the architecture of the Central East Side District in Portland. I have it in my hand here. This area, the Central East Side, is home to our center on Southeast Grand Avenue. So it really made sense for us to undertake this project that shows the interesting evolution of the area from the 19th century to today. And I think it's actually one of the first projects that's explored the range of architectural styles in this part of Portland. A lot of our work has also focused on preservation policy in Portland, which has definitely not slowed down over the past year. And so our volunteer advocacy committee has been really busy. One big issue last year was the adoption of major changes to the city's code for historic places. So, so through our blog, for example, we broke down the extensive code for you and we shared insights on it and pointed you to resources so that you could learn more and you could let city leaders know why you're concerned about Portland's historic places and why. But in fact, some of our most important work is behind the scenes, but it makes us a stronger organization to serve you better. For example, we relocated our artifact collection and we're building better storage systems. This will make the collection more visible and accessible to you. We're training new walking tour docents and, and so that you can enjoy more tours and do so for many years to come. We're also taking deliberate steps to make our organization and our work more inclusive and equitable. We're on solid foundation as we move forward. But to reach our goals takes hard work, dedication, and support day in and day out. So we appreciate you being here tonight to support us in all of our endeavors. We're optimistic about what the rest of the year holds. The AHC can't do this work without you. So tonight we're asking you for your help. Make a donation at any level that's right for you. Your gift, any amount, goes a long way to support the AHC's operations and programs. Click on the donate button above or text to visit AHC to the phone number 56651, like it shows on the screen. So Alan, a few folks let us know before tonight that they would like to donate to the AHC as their way to encourage others to join them in giving. This includes some of our board members. Board member Joan Plank and David Williams have made a $1,500 donation and board member Larry Kojaku has contributed $1,000. Thank you, Joan, Dave, and Larry, my old neighbor. They invite you to join them in giving to the AHC tonight. If you need help donating or buying raffle tickets, the AHC staff and volunteers are standing by. Just remember the number, 503-231-7264. It's on the screen. Yeah, that's right. And a few other members of our board have made a commitment before tonight that we wish to share with you, and they invite you to give as well. Richard Michelson has made a $10,000 donation, and a fellow board member has made a $4,000 donation. Thank you so much, Rick, whose generosity extends to our organization, the city, preservation, actually the whole country. His financial support 
time and expertise has been a, a big boon to historic preservation. And all the board members, thank you for your support. Stephanie, I know you're working hard behind the scenes right over there. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And we'll say goodbye to you for right now. Thanks, Alan. And to everyone, we're eager to welcome you to our center on Southeast Grand Avenue. In April, we launch a new exhibit featuring photographs by artist Intisar Abioto that explore black spaces and community in Portland. And we look forward to seeing you then, if not before. All right. Thank you. Well, she goes off, off to the side to take care of things there, working behind the scenes. So we want to take a moment in our program to give a big thanks to our platinum sponsor, Archiform. We're so grateful for the support of Archiform, a design build firm whose work is inspired by the stories that surround the structures they design, build, and renovate. We spent a couple hours with them a few years ago. Just amazing amount of design was done. It's very productive. I'd like to thank, and we would all like to thank, Anna and Richard DeWolf and the entire team at Archiform. They're, oh, it's been 25 years. Wow, way to go, guys. We appreciate everyone who participates in the work, work of the AHC. And tonight we have sponsors, we have volunteers, we have board members, we have staff, all showing their support for the AHC. So let's hear from a few of them. Hello, I'm Anneli Wolf. I'm owner of Archiform, a design build firm here in Portland, Oregon that specializes in the restoration and remodel of structures built prior to the 70s. I'm a business member and support the AHC for over 20 years because their passion for education and research and the many opportunities for business members to share their expertise has been a wonderful resource. Thank you, Architectural Heritage Center. Hi, my name is Katie Ewers. I volunteered with the Architectural Heritage Center for six years and I'm a member of the Diversity, Equity, Accessibility and Inclusion Committee. I support the AHC's work because I believe that the built environment is one of the richest forms of public history education, and because the AHC is working to become a better and more accessible resource for the entire Portland community. Hi, my name is Robert Jordan, and I have been a walking tour docent at the AHC for a number of years now. And one thing I'd like to say is that I'm really impressed by how we have expanded the scope and meaning of the walking tours, including more about the social dynamics of the city, not just the architectural styles and the engineering of the buildings, but more information about the communities and the people who live in and around these historic buildings. I think the AHC has done a great job of importing, importing that information to uh, citizens of Portland, and I hope you will support the AHC. Did you like Anna's dog? Came right on cue. That dog's a pro. Will you join Anna, Katie, and Robert in supporting the AHC? If you're just streaming in right now, welcome. Tonight, we're just featuring a few, of, uh, a few stories about our city's architecture. This is part of our work to better understand our history and save what makes this place unique. We hope you take a moment to support this work. Click on the donate button, which I think is above, and uh, visit AHC to the phone number 56651. That's on the screen. You'll get a text message that will take you through the payment process. You can select an amount or give a custom amount that's meaningful to you. Your name will be recognized on our giving screen, and we will also acknowledge all donors on the AHC website next week. You know, the work of the AHC is about our city's built spaces, but it's also about the people who live here. Coming up is a special video that shares both personal stories and community stories. Centered, centered around the Albina neighborhood, it's a conversation about race, neighborhood, history, and change. The AHC has had the privilege of bringing together seven Albina neighborhood residents, past and present, from across multiple generations to talk about the built environment, diversity, and race through personal experiences. We wanted to hear from these residents and for them to hear from each other about what changes in Portland's land, landscape mean to them. Now this video is called Northeast Voices. It was created by filmmaker and activist Devin Boss, who himself was born and raised in Northeast Portland. Today, he runs a black-owned film production company called Northeast Productions that focuses on increasing the presence of black people in the film industry and collaborating on projects with diverse viewpoints. This video is an excerpt from a longer conversation project 
with these residents about gentrification and race made possible by a grant to the AHC from Oregon Humanities. Our special guest to introduce this video project is Karis Stoudemire Phillips. Karis is Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Community Initiatives at Moda Health. As a lifelong resident of Northeast Portland, she's active in the Boys Neighborhood Association and an, acti and, and an advocate excuse me, of the community involvement in the future of North and Northeast Portland. My name is Kara Stoudemire Phillips. I'm a native Black Portlander, grew up in North Portland, and I'm live here today from Dean's Beauty Salon and Barbershop, gathered here with some old friends and some new friends to tell some Portland stories about Black Portlanders. And it's time today to learn some of that history. This was the best neighborhood that I ever grow up in. Um, I, we didn't live in this neighborhood. We lived maybe 10 blocks from here, but the community was so intact the way back in the 1970s that we walked up and down the street. Everyone knew who you were. That was, those are Miss Dean's grandkids or those are so-and-so's grandkids. And so we always had a sense of community. I grew up in Walnut Park mm -hmm. um, and it was all black community, very close knit. All the neighbors knew you. Uh, if you did something you weren't supposed to, any of the neighbors could correct you and send you home and told you to tell your parents what you'd done, you'd get corrected again. So um, very close knit and you could uh, be outside. Everybody knew when the lights came on, it, you know, you needed to be headed home. Uh, and again, everybody looked out for everyone else and uh, it was a comfortable neighborhood you felt safe in the neighborhood. I remember when I first opened up uh, in, in 1975, I remember very clearly that most of um, us working right here in Northeast were not living past 33rd. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember that How real true. distinctly. And this is from an outsider standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I remember a lot of the uh, jewels and some of the Nice places all along this avenue were just amazing and just take a look at it now. What we didn't know um, at the time we were living here and being raised here is how desirable this property was. Mm -hmm. This is a part of Northeast, I mean, part of Portland that's in close proximity to downtown. It's in close proximity to the airport. It's in close proximity to the freeway that will take you to the mountain and also to the coast. And so people really wanted to be here and they are now here. And in and, and, and doing so, they did displace many black families who are now out in East County, yes. which is far away from almost everything, everything. and even up, up until recently didn't have adequate public transportation. So it's been a real transformation in that sense, a real displacement and a removal and a replacement of families who realize just how desirable this land is. I was born in the 70s, so I was getting the tail end of what the neighborhood really used to be when it was really cohesive. Mm -hmm. So like, being a 70s baby and then coming of age in the 80s, two different kind of uh, dichotomies. It, the neighborhood was really in, a, in flux, mm -hmm. in transition. So we had a lot of that that was discussed before with, you know, the tight, tight knit communities and um, family members living like next door to each other, or right around the corner, and we we shared a lot within the community, but also was the beginning of that breakdown. You know, the things that like right now we begin to see and talk about uh, redlining and gentrification and all the blight and nuisance ordinances, the things that were placed on us uh, from poor policy. Mm -hmm. But also we had that, that so-called war on drugs that flooded our neighborhood and communities with drugs. Is the neighborhood, has it changed since you've been there? Uh, very much so. <laughs> kind of like to your point, uh, like it, it feels like I have neighbors, but I don't live in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
Um, I mean, I remember growing up there whenever someone new would move into the neighborhood, they would come by or there'd be some sort of meeting of the families where we'd get to know like who was moving into the neighborhood. But lately, I mean, I've seen families come and go and not have one conversation yeah. with them. Um, so it feels fractured on many levels. There are still some families there from when I grew up there, which I appreciate, but even um, just the interactions are just different and just the feel of the neighborhood is different. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to live in that house and um, I'm a teacher uh, and so otherwise I would not be able to live in that neighborhood <laughs> if it wasn't a family home so I couldn't afford it so I feel yeah, very absolutely. like privileged to have that opportunity but it definitely does not feel the same as when I was growing up. What um, is very important is to understand the neighborhood that you come into and I know Cleo and I have been on some various committees where we've talked about just this, um, where when you come in, learn the history. Learn the history. Um, I've never, I mean, I've lived other places, but I've never gone somewhere and not tried to learn about it, right. you know? Um, and have a, that gives you a respect for the community. Um, but I think that a lot of people now, they just come to Portland because I saw it on the Food Network or I saw it on Grimm or I saw it on, you know, you fill in the blank because we're the hot place to be. And I know that for a fact, I serve on a, a board where I, we get that information from Travel Portland that we I have been like in the top 10 of cities to move to in, for the past 10 years. Um, so I would just urge people when you come, take the time to learn because we've done a lot of things like this Cleo and his wife have been a part of several art installments around the city that are trying to tell that story. So when yes. you go into that community, you can see that piece of art that has the history of talking about along Williams, along Alberta. So there's been um, an effort for people to learn, to teach, because we want to teach the rich history of that. I have the opportunity at work, um, we're celebrating Black History Month, of course. And so I take that on and like, y'all gonna learn today. Now I'd like to welcome a longtime friend and the current president of the Bosco Milligan Foundation Board of Directors, and thank you for that, Denise McGriff. Hi, Alan. Hey, Denise. We're all grateful to all the people in, the, in that video who took time to gather on a Sunday afternoon in the Albina neighborhood to share their stories, thoughts, and experiences. The full-length conversations that, that took place at Dean's Beauty Salon and Barbershop will soon be available on the AHC's YouTube channel. We want to thank Dean's owner, Kim Brown, for hosting the gathering at this special venue. In fact, the National Park Service listed Dean's on the National Register of Historic Places on February 23rd. Dean's is among three other African-American sites listed on the National Register in just the past two years. One of my favorite places, Billy Webb's Elks Lodge, was placed on the National Register in 2020. The reason why we're seeing this cluster of listings is because the major research project that our organization completed in 2020 is called African American Resources in Portland, 1851 to 1973. In a nutshell, our project provides a comprehensive history and tool to help these properties that are part of the African American heritage to get listed on the National Register. It lays the groundwork, so to speak, for this important official recognition. This is important because it protects 
these specific places. And the bigger picture is it diversifies the kind of properties put on the National Register to include those that tell the stories of historically marginalized people. An ongoing goal of our work is to better understand all the diverse histories that are behind Portland's architecture. Thanks, Denise, for telling us more about this big step toward, uh, forward in preservation that the AHC was part of. Now, to everyone watching, if you want to support the effort to tell a fuller story of our built environment, if you think this is important, please help sustain it. As you donate, you will see your name on the donor screen. Thank you to a couple of people here. We have George Amy, James Hoyer, Jeannie Schapp, and board member Kim Worland. Yeah. Our very own executive director, Stephanie Whitlock, Who's made a donation. The scenes? Let me see. Oh, here comes a list. Jean Zondervan, um, Nancy Carr, Martha Belusky, George Amy, we did him. Uh, James Manning, um, yeah, the names are coming up now. Yep. Jennifer Burns, yeah. Susan Hansen, Connie Shipley, Kim and Mike Moreland again, Barbara <laughs> Bichelle, hi Barbara, Jeannie Schapp again. Uh, yep. They're like old friends. friends. Yep. Yeah, they're starting to roll now, so let's keep them coming in. Yep. As mentioned earlier, a few supporters let us know in advance that, that they're a dance of this evening that they'd like to make a donation. Okay, listen to this one. Jim and Sue Kelly, $25,000. Thank you so much once again. The Kellys are longtime supporters of the AHC. We've received a commitment from another board member, Steve Dodderer and Kevin Krause, who are giving $10,000. Thank you. Steve is a past president, and thank you for that, uh, of the board and also a walking tour docent. So thank you so much, Steve and Kevin. We also heard from two former board members that would like to make a donation. Fred Leeson and his spouse, Barbara Coleman, have generously donated $11,000. Cool. Fred is an advisory board member and co-chair of our current advocacy committee, and he's also a past president. Some of you may follow his preservation blog called Building on History. If you haven't checked into that, please do. It is worth the look. Another former board member, Alan Took, is making a donation of $15,000. Alan, we thank you so much for your steadfast support, and we hope that you're here in Portland today watching this. If not, we send you our love wherever you are. <laughs> thank you, other Alan. <laughs> Fred, Barbara, and Alan invite you to join them tonight, because every single donation counts. Thank you to all of these people who pledged a donation before tonight. They made their donations and ask you to join them tonight in supporting the AHC. Here's some more people. Joanne and Norm Carlson donated $400 and endless hours. Laurel Dickey donated $350. Thank you, Laurel. Eileen Fitzsimons and Gary Blackmer donated $1,000 and the Beach House. Remember that. Judy Dobble has made a gift of $1,000. Thank you, Judy. Joanne, Laurel, Eileen, and Judy are all longtime volunteers and donors to the AHC, so thank you to all of them. Thank you to, wow, a big list of people. Where shall we start? Oh, I think we should start with Philip Austin. All right. Well, we'll just pick out some names to give you an idea here. Robert Mercer, uh, Elizabeth Milliken. Oh, here we have some more. Yes. Are these the, ooh. Lincoln, Turchow, one of our board members. Okay. All right. William uh, Wilson. Michelle. Yeah, Jennifer Burns. Uh, the names are starting to pop up now. So, you know, uh, oh, wait a second. We have a, a few more board members who have donated before tonight. Sorry to zip past them. Uh, Tracy Prince, thank you. Denise McGriff herself, can't forget Denise, uh, and Jackie Peterson Loomis. They encourage you to give as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You know, last fall, as part of a community partnership with the nonprofit Portland Indigenous Marketplace, the AHC exhibited the work of indigenous artists and craftspeople at the West Block Building. We appreciate this opportunity and thank artist A.C. Ramirez for sharing thoughts about this partnership. Hello, my name is A.C. Ramirez, and I'm here to talk to you about the Architectural Heritage Center. It's a fabulous place. It has great energy. The staff is phenomenal. It's wheelchair accessible. And I really enjoyed having my art showing there for the few months that it was there. Um, hands down, it was the, the best experience I've had with a gallery in Portland. I encourage you to go down and check it out. And don't forget, they're a nonprofit. They take donations. Did you like that last sentence? Great guy. 
Thank you again to AC. We were so honored to have your beautiful work fill our gallery last fall. It was a wonderful exhibit. If you've been watching the, the program and you care about the work that the AHC does, now is the time to contribute and demonstrate the, that you support the organization. Nudge your spouse, your partner, your friend, she gave, me too, and make that donation. Thank you to everyone who has donated so far this evening. You're moving the thermometer up. All right, well, we're in the, there is the thermometer, okay? We're in the final stretch of the evening, and this is such an important movement that we've invited another board member of the AHC, or another member of the AHC staff, excuse me, Katie McGee, who's on the staff. And I'm going to slide over. welcome. You remember, yeah. Uh, Katie was a co-host last year. Uh, I was her co-host. She was my co-host, whichever, uh, at, at last year's virtual event. Katie is the development director of the AHC. Can you tell us how the donations tonight are going to help the organization? Oh, well, hi, Alan and Denise. Hi. It's great to see you here. Yes, your gift provides direct support to our programs and operations. This includes new exhibits and walking tours. You're also supporting our hardworking staff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're all part of a collective effort to better understand our history. This takes effort, but it also takes money. That's right, every gift counts. A thousand dollar gift helps us care for our historic West Block building. It's almost 140 years old and requires regular maintenance and repairs. Not to mention there are those unexpected things that come up with an older building. A hundred dollar donation <laughs> enables us to recruit and train five new walking tour docents. $75 helps a staff person attend a professional development program. You can tell we all have old buildings. Uh, someone might ask, <laughs> what can you do with $50? Oh, $50, $50, great question. For example, enables us to offer free admission for a family of four to visit our center through the program like Blue Star Museums for active duty military personnel and their families. Cool. The organization has been very resilient and adaptive during the pandemic. We really want to thank you our volunteers and donors for stepping up during this challenging time so that we can continue our work to educate, advocate, and support Oregon's architecture, history, and culture. Okay, we're hearing from uh, a lot of people. Um, which one are we reading here? The, we don't have the same screens that you, uh, that you do, so. Well, I see Francine Grew. Oh, yes. yeah, great. And I see uh, Judy Dobble. All right. Tom Hubka. Con Connie oh, Shipley. Yes. Leslie Hutchinson. Oh, Lincoln, you said him before. Oh, I yeah. see Aisha Gazul, who we're going to hear from soon. Yes. Right, okay, good. Um, all right, well, let's keep the, uh, keep the I hate to do that. Yeah. But, uh, keep those, <laughs> keep <laughs> those donations coming let's in. Let's keep them coming in. It's really great to see, to see everybody. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's so gratifying that the AHC has such loyal supporters. We can see what we can, you can see what we can accomplish if we pull together to support the AHC's work to educate and advocate for Portland's architecture, culture, and history. Yeah, there are several ways to make a gift. You can click on that donate button. I know you've been hearing about this. You can text visit AHC to 56651. You and can call 503-231-7264. There is a slight delay between the time you donate and when we receive it, but rest assured, we will receive your gift. We're trying to make this as easy for you as possible. So while folks are getting on their phone or their keyboard, we want to get back to our stories. So Denise, what can you tell us about the next video? Well, Alan, I am really excited about this next video short because it's all about a landmark that is near and dear to my heart, the Burnside Bridge. We created this video to celebrate how the bridge has been part of our city's culture for over 95 years. The story is told from the perspective of different people in Portland, a historian, a bridge operator, a social justice advocate, and a skateboarder. Let's watch. There are so many things that make the Burnside Bridge unique. It's always been my favorite bridge because I love the 1920s period. Obviously, the towers are very unique compared to the other bridges. I feel like the Burnside is the heart of the city. The Burnside Bridge was really the only early bridge designed in conjunction with architects. They did the decorative balustrade that you see on the side of the current bridge and also the little octagonal towers that stand on the piers where the bascule mechanisms actually operate. Before the Burnside Bridge was constructed, 
Bridges were really seen as utilitarian objects, and they weren't usually done as municipal developments. Early on, they were done privately. So people were just really interested in getting the most out of their money that they could, and that didn't usually include hiring architects. Engineers were just fine to get the job done. So all the early bridges before Burnside just were very basic wood and steel structures, but they didn't really have any actual architectural design elements incorporated into them until Burnside came along in the 1920s. The first Burnside Bridge was constructed right after the city's consolidation in 1891. So that is the consolidation of Portland at the time, which was only downtown on the west side of the river, with what was known then as East Portland, a separate city where Architectural Heritage Center is today. So the Burnside Bridge was a real prominent symbol of this new growth and development of Portland, not just as one small city on the west side of the Willamette River, but now grown and developed into the greater metropolitan Portland that we all think of today. All of our bridges in the downtown area were designed before the risk of a major earthquake was known. So now that we know that that risk is there and that we're potentially overdue for a major earthquake, we want to have at least one downtown bridge that we can count on. If we're fortunate and maybe that earthquake doesn't happen as soon as it could, we also just want to have a crossing we can count on for the next hundred years, and we know that the current bridge won't last that long. We hear from the public that the operator towers are kind of favorite features that mean a lot to the public. So people have said, can you save those operator towers? Or some people have even said, can you reuse them in the new bridge? The towers were never designed to be you know, disassembled and moved and that sort of thing. But we know that that's something that a lot of people have asked about. So we will look at doing that. Things like bridge railings are, you know, at least a section of it, are common things that are oftentimes able to be preserved and reused in some location. One of the most unique things about the Burnside Bridge is that it has a world famous, do it yourself, no permits, skate park underneath it on the east side on 2nd Avenue. And we know that this is a very special place. It's so special, even it's not so ancient in years, but it's really significant around the world as one of the first kind of do-it-yourself urban skate parks. Through this project, you can imagine it's a little uh, concerning to them when we're talking about replacing the bridge that covers their skate park. But we have worked out a plan that allows them to remain There'll be some closures for safety during the removal of the old bridge and the construction of the new bridge, but we think that the skate park uh, that people use can pretty much remain as it is, and there'll just be a point where the columns that come down from the existing bridge have to be cut off at a certain height, but we can preserve a lot of that. My first time under the bridge was, I was actually skating downtown and I ran into a uh, Mark Scott, he was skating down at uh, Paranoid Park also. Back then, just having a skateboard, you're connected to anyone else who has a skateboard. He said that there was this groovy thing that was going on underneath the Burnside Bridge that we should take a look at. We went and checked it out. and That was the beginning of the rest is history. The camaraderie of skateboarders just came together and fueled the hot spot of underneath the bridge. E each piece that was built under there fueled the next piece. In my mind, it was never understood that it, there was like a park being built. It was all about the moment. The park's always under construction. 30 plus years old and I, I don't ever see it being a finished product. I really just went out there to be a part of the movement, to be a part of the moment. We are, we're marching through the streets, but you look all around you and it's just this magnificent kind of communal uprising. It was a beautiful thing to be a part of. I remember the feeling that I had during that, during that moment, during that entire span. Um, it felt powerful, it felt, it, felt, it felt like something I'd never felt before and so we decided we were gonna, we just wanted to keep doing that. And I mean, that's really just kind of like how it all unfolded. It was a day by day. And I remember we decided, you know, this, this is a powerful group of people. It's like, we should take the Burnside Bridge. 
Darren, another co-founder, had this kind of elaborate performance planned that would instill that feeling of like what it's like to be powerless in a moment like the one George Floyd experienced. And it was just a very powerful moment. I remember being a part of it and just looking around and, and just feeling like I was in a dream. It was just like the most surreal thing I've ever been a part of. Portland is known as the city of bridges. As a bridge operator, I think you can't help but feel very protective of the city. Not just because of the physical location of where you're at, but your job is to watch and look out for people, for safety, for uh, vessels coming up river, to be prepared to you know, assist. It's like you're in a turret, like you're in a castle. It's the main route, emergency route, from the west side to the east side. But for me, it's more than that. It, it, I always refer to her as a her. I don't know why, but I feel like she's the matriarch of Portland, and she's kind of watching over everybody. And she's subtle. She's not tall and grandiose and, and blocking the views. She's just this very horizontal bridge, very delicate. I feel this history on that bridge when I'm on it and in the towers. I don't know, I just, I get very poetic and <laughs> when I talk about the Burnside. Okay, did you see Aisha, the bridge operator? She's donated tonight. Great. This video was created by Aiden Powell of Aiden Powell Media and produced by Gene Zondervan. Aiden is a recent graduate in film from Portland State University, and this is one of his earliest, his earliest projects. Aiden did a fantastic job in making this video. He did a lot of research, uh, walking back and forth across the bridge too many times to count. The Architectural Heritage Center has been following the Burnside Bridge replacement project since its earliest phases. At the beginning of the project, the AHC, Restore Oregon, and others stressed how important it was to respect the Skidmore Old Town National Landmark District by leaving open views of the district, the cityscape, the river, and the famous Portland sign. A little success story is that the bridge design adopted by the project committee achieves that protection for the district. The AHC's advocacy committee continues to actively follow the bridge design approval process. Our goal for the new bridge is to maintain the civic and ceremonial nature of the bridge so that it continues to be a fitting site for many activities like the Rose Festival parade, parades, Black Lives Matter demonstrations. With an uncertain future of the bridge, civic stories like this are the ones that need to be shared and capture the importance of the historic record. And the AHC is here to tell the stories behind these landmarks and support their preservation. Yes, please know that you are making a difference in our ability to produce original programs and projects like the ones you've heard about tonight and that you participate in year in, year out. All right, let's check the thermometer before we wind down for the night. And oh, yes! yes. It's working again! <laughs> right. Having a little trouble getting it there. Oh, apparently fantastic. That's, that's what's Thank actually happened. What do we have? $90,465, and they're still coming in. If you want a final word on this, it's going to be on our website next week. You can see the, the donors and how well we did. But this is doing really well, so give yourself a big round of applause. Yes. We did that. Didn't you we? did, you did. All of you, too. You can continue to give tonight, tomorrow. Oh, okay, really. Anytime, anytime you want to donate. That's great. Your gift will count towards our goal and raise funds to support the Architectural Heritage Center. Okay, here's a reminder that the raffle continues through 7 p.m. tomorrow night, Wednesday. You have another 24, 25 hours. Yep. So you still have time to buy raffle tickets to win a lovely vacation stay at a beach cottage in Seaview, Washington. And this cottage is fully furnished and within walking distance from the beach, restaurants, and a brew pub. 
sorry, I blew that. It's a brew pub. It sleeps <laughs> five, well, it sleeps five, so it's a real deal for a $50 raffle ticket. You can also win an emergency gas shutoff valve for all of those of you who need it, which is almost all of you, and it's installation at, at a Portland area home donated by Earthquake Tech. The valve and the installation are valued at $750. So again, this is a great deal for a raffle ticket. Yes, thank you again to Steve Gemmel and Earthquake Tech for being the presenting sponsor of yes. the 2022 Building Stories virtual event. Thank you to our platinum sponsor, Arcaform. Mm -hmm. thank yep. We yeah. thank our gold sponsor and local business, Westmoreland Liquor. Right. Yes. There we are. As things begin to open up, we look forward to seeing you in person again on one of our walking tours, maybe even mine, and also <laughs> at the Architectural Heritage Center in the central east side of Portland. A recording of this live broadcast will be available online through the AHC website. You can share it with your friends and family who could not attend if they like what we're doing and they can make a gift in support of our work. It's because of you that this has been such a special evening. It's been my pleasure to be your host and I'd like to thank guests uh, Stephanie Whitlock who is behind the scenes, Kara Stoudemire Phillips who was on the video, Katie McGee, Denise McGriff, oh there's Stephanie, uh, Denise. Uh, McGriff, our supporters who, join, who joined us by video, and to all of you for joining us. Thank you so much, and good night. Thank, Thank you. you.